Okay. So. All right. Welcome to this open session here at Davos. My name is Dan Shapiro. I am the founder and director of the Harvard International Negotiation Program. The focus of our work is on how you deal with the emotional and the identity-based dimensions of conflict and negotiation. Uh, and it is an honor to be here today with all of you, with our panelists as well. The, the topic of our session today is on multiculturalism. And the idea is that it's more than just this abstract concept that, uh, that's out there, but it's really about you and me and all of us and how we can interact most effectively together. Uh, and over the course of the past few days here at Davos, the conversations with, within the World Economic Forum uh, discussions, there's been a, a strong undercurrent of conversation around how you deal with these issues of multiculturalism. How on the one hand, our world is more interconnected than ever with technology, globalization, e economically, and so on. And yet at the same time, we're seeing increased fragmentation within societies, increased tensions um, at the international levels. What's going on? and what can be done about it. That's what our subject will actually be today. So before we uh, hear from our distinguished panel and before I even introduce this panel, we have a wonderful opportunity today to hear from a global leader who I admire deeply. I also consider him a friend. Uh, um, so uh, someone who, from personal uh, experience, I recognize as someone who is just passionate about the world, and I think the world recognize that, recognizes that as well. Please join me in welcoming His Royal Highness Haakon, the Crown Prince of Norway. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> You're that was very nice. <laughs> I enjoyed that. <laughs> Dan's great, by the way. Um, you should uh, ask him after when there's a, a Q&A, you should ask him about uh, negotiation techniques. He's like incredible uh, in negotiations. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm in a school, kind of like this. It's great to be back, by the way. Uh, I was here a few years back um, doing a session. Um, I was at a school and we were hearing from kids. 16-year-olds, um, 15-year-olds. Um, I do that quite a lot. Um, I go to schools and I listen to the insights of young people. And it's amazing uh, what they have to offer. And we have so much to learn. Uh, so it's always energizing for me. Okay, so um, these kids are lining up one after the other to tell their stories. And this girl comes up to the mic. And uh, she's wearing a hijab. And she says, I have a friend in another school. And there was a boy there, a Jewish boy, that was bullied. And it was bad. It was really bad. Uh, and then the Gaza conflict started. And it got worse. And she said that her friend decided to start going uh, or, or being together with this boy during recess, during the breaks, but also on the way to and back from school. And that really improved the situation. Now, of course, her friend got a lot of heat for it from her peers, but it really improved the situation. And it dawned on me that this girl had actually unraveled, figured out a way of solving a really complex problem that we in the grown-up world are not really able to do. Now, so in this example, multiculturalism is both successful and failing. Thundering, if you will. I, I, I had to look that word up. I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> um, so we got to be able to deal with a reality where multiculturalism in parallel at the same time is successful and at times is failing. Now, let me just uh, tell you uh, about or um, point out a few things. 
through evolution, um, we have learned how to tackle close relations, right? Uh, family, friends, the people around us, our tribe, right? Through evolution, that has been what we have needed uh, to survive, to prosper, uh, to be successful. So we're good at these close relations, at being responsible uh, in these close relations. But you know, if, if you go into uh, the, the Congress Center here or in Davos, in one day, we meet more people than some of our predecessor far, predecessors far back met in an entire lifetime, right? Now, the question is, how will we be able to adapt to a world that is much more complex? We all have virtual relationships with millions of people. Will we be able to be responsible to such a large group? Are we able to react to the complex reality that we are exposed to in a constructive manner that will lead to a better world? In short, will we be able to be responsible global citizens? Now, it's important to remember that we have so much more in common as human beings than what separates us. We have so much more in common. A couple of years back, um, I attended a lecture by MIT professor uh, Eric Lander. He is uh, one of the leading experts on the human genome. He told us some astonishing and quite eye-opening facts. Only one thousandth of our human genome separates us. Genetically, we are 99.9% .9 the same. At some point, the human species counted around 10,000 individuals. 10,000 individuals worldwide, that's it. So we're all their descendants. We have much, much, much more in common than what separates us. The human genome consists of around 3 billion building blocks. 3 billion. Up to now, researchers have found four that determine skin color. Professor Launder estimates that there are between 10 and 12 in all. 10 or 12 out of 3 billion. That's nothing. Now, I wanted to also just mention that there's a lot of work being done on multiple identities. These are ideas by Amartya Sen and Kwame Anthony Apaya, um, the economist and philosopher, uh, and many others. Um, so multiple identities means that we, like, take me, for instance, right? Um, I'm a man. I have children. Um, I like hip-hop. Um, I have a beard. Yeah. That too. Um, I'm Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, British, German. Now, so the idea is we have all of these multiple identities. And it's possible for you to strengthen several of these identities at the same time. It's not like if you're strengthening one, like if I'm becoming more Swedish, I'm also, uh, th then I'm becoming less Norwegian. It's not like that. I can become more Swedish and more Norwegian at the same time, right? So that's multiple identities. So I would slightly <clears throat> um, advise against the idea of a melting pot. I would say what we would probably be better off thinking about is how we live or how we act um, so that we show mutual respect and peaceful coexistence, or maybe even compassionate uh, coexistence. Um, forgive me, I, I just came from uh, a session on, on uh, the art and science of happiness, so I'm, I'm a little bit uh, sort of on that track. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, Apaya says, uh, he's a philosopher, it is crucial to remember always that we are not simply black or white or yellow or brown, gay or straight or bisexual, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist or Confucian, but we also, brothers and sisters, parents and children, liberals, conservatives and leftists, 
teachers and lawyers and automakers and gardeners, fans of the Padres and the Bruins, amateurs of Grand Rock and lovers of Wagner, movie buffs, MTV holics, mystery readers, surfers and singers, poets and pet lovers, students and teachers, friends and lovers. Archbishop Tutu, Emer uh, the Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, says, God is really actually just trying to teach us one lesson. I think he said that here uh, when he was doing his session here. That we are all part of the same family. That's the lesson he's trying to teach us. Now, if you really understood this lesson, there would not be war, he says. There would not be starvation because we would not drop bombs on our sister and we would not let our brother starve. We can bring the world forward. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Hakan. And I hope I proved myself right about Hakan. <laughs> uh, so I, I'd now like to introduce uh, the distinguished panel uh, joining us today, who will provide a, a variety of different perspectives on this question of multiculturalism. Uh, and with very fascinating, incredible backgrounds and experience. Uh, and let me introduce them, not in sequence here, but in alphabetical order, actually, uh, with Cesar Conde, who is president of Univision Networks in the United States. Uh, Rosie Dasker, who is an author in the United, Kingdoms, uh, in the United Kingdom and is writing a book, a book's just about to come out, uh, on issues of multiculturalism. Uh, Philip Jennings, who is general secretary of UniGlobal Union. Uh, and then we have... Uh, we have Tumi Mak Makabo, founder and executive director of Africa Worldwide Media, and also a young global leader with the World Economic Forum. We have Demet Mutlu, who is founder and chief executive officer of Trendyol, uh, uh, sorry, Trendyol.com in Turkey, and also a global shaper with the World Economic Forum. We have Lucas Ryman, a member of the National Council and the Swiss People's Party. And finally, we have Mel Young, president of the Homeless World Cup, which is based in the United Kingdom. So let's start, uh, Caesar. Uh, your perspectives. Uh, so uh, what's impeding multiculturalism uh, from really taking hold? If, we take, uh, if, we, um, if one would agree with the, what, what the forum is suggesting, that multiculturalism, multiculturalism is floundering, it's, it's in trouble uh, in some sort of way, what's the problem and what can be done about it from your perspective? Sure. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for the invitation. You know, I would, uh, I, I would begin by saying that I think any discussion of multiculturalism uh, depends on how one defines multiculturalism. And I think if one defines, uh, defines it, as I do, uh, a society where empowered individuals choose to adopt part of the culture of the host society, but at the same time proactively choose to retain part of their ethnicity, their culture, uh, in the like, mm -hmm. while at the same time living within a uh, similar va a value system, in our case in the United States, democracy, freedom, uh, and, and such, mm -hmm. uh, I would argue that the United States uh, is seeing uh, an, uh, a society where multiculturalism is, 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 is very successful yeah. um, and is part of our DNA. Um, I would give you one, I think, wonderful case uh, study and case example, um, the, the Hispanic or, or Latin American immigrant community mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, today is the largest minority uh, group in the United States. It's over 50 million mm -hmm. uh, individuals. Um, we are one in six uh, of the entire U.S. population. Uh, and I think that uh, this case study is, is, is interesting because there's three reasons why it's been successful. I think one, it's because of its size. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, it's uh, one in six of, of all of America. Second is because of its growth rate. Um, even though it's coming off a big base, it's growing exponentially both from immigration as well as from birth rate. Mm -hmm. And I think the third reason, it's the impact that it has had on this, uh, on this society. Uh, it's had both social, cultural, economic, and certainly political implications. Um, one quick anecdote, I think most people in the United States would argue that uh, the Hispanic or the Latino vote mm -hmm. is going to be the driving or the swing vote mm -hmm. as to who comes out in the U.S. presidency. Uh, in November of 2012. Yeah. Um, so I think a very good example of where multiculturalism has worked and is at the core of, of, of our American society. 
Great. And well, I, I think we we'll want to dig further in a, a little bit uh, to try and understand, what's, is, is that a model that can be replicated in other places? What are the downfalls, the strengths of that kind of model? Right now, the goal is just to get a short snapshot from each of our uh, panelists here. Uh, and let's move on now to Rosie, please. Hi. Um, I have um, been living in New York for the last six years. I'm the author of a book called A Small Fortune. Um, Dan described it as about multicultural issues. I'd like to say it's not exactly, but it's a novel and it's a story. And it's about the British-Pakistani community. Um, I was born in Britain to a Pakistani father and a British mother. And that really inspires the story. So it's a, it's a personal story. But I guess I've been invited as, a, as an example of someone from a multicultural background. I really don't like the term multicultural. I feel it's, it's freighted with all sorts of um, liberal baggage and right-wing baggage. So I, I, I think it would be nice if we could discuss what we mean by that, what we mean by multiculturalism. But that aside, um, I've been living in New York for the last six years, which is, of course, a, a, you know, the, a perfect example of a very successful multicultural place. And um, I don't believe that multiculturalism is in trouble. I don't believe it's, um, I don't believe it's a problem. And um, I'm interested to hear what the audience thinks. Great. Thank you. And Philip. I'm here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> There you are. <laughs> you moved on me. No. Okay, no, I'm still here. Yeah. Please. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Or as we like to say in the neon, grüezi miteinander. <laughs> My name is Philip Jennings. I'm a, I'm a union leader. As an organization, we see a world of diversity. We see a diverse world, which is the norm. Switzerland is a diverse country. I will never forget the time I went with my football team in Nyon and we spent a weekend in Murtetal. Mm. And it was on that occasion I began to discover this whole sense of Graben, which I still struggle with, but it's a sign of diversity, multiculturalism, multilingualism. And even if we couldn't speak together, we yodeled famously together. <laughs> in my job, my organization stands against discrimination, and we defend diversity. We are open to all cultures, religions, people of gender, sexual orientation. At the same time, we fight intolerance in the workplace. I want a workplace free from fear. And this whole question seems to go in ebbs and flow. Sometimes when political parties don't have a coherent economic project, they begin to move into other areas. We are living through a very special period in our economic history. 225 million people unemployed, one in two on a vulnerable contract, 80 million young people unemployed, inequality which we've not seen since the 1920s. We're living the great Gatsby time again. This feeds into the conversation of hate, of scapegoating that it's someone else's fault. And that feeds into a political discourse, which means these questions of diversity and tolerance become threatened. My message to everybody here is that the way this world has been run is not leading to cohesive societies, that it's not enough to take care of that 1%, but that 99% needs to have moments of hope decent work, a decent school, and edu decent education, and a home, and that's not happening. I will fight that in my organization, wherever it shows its face. I live in a diverse country. I'm proud of the traditions of this country, and I think many of the things which happen in this country, which I hope to talk about in the local communes, is a sign of strength. Thank you. Thank you. To me. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, I have to say, I, I, it sounds fascinating. So you need, and I need to talk a little bit about your experience and the, what did you call it? Rushdi Graben. Rushdi Graben. Yeah. Well, okay. you see, no, wait, later, later. No, no. later. <laughs> 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 um, I, think, I think one of the challenges for me, I'm a South African, and, uh, and I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with our history. 
Um, and I'm very, very wary of labeling. I think Bruce is quite right that, you know, the label is, is where things tend to come undone. Mm -hmm. In my view, here's the reality. Mm -hmm. The reality is that we no longer live in an environment where we're all isolated in little pockets around the world and have very rare occasion to exchange or meet each other. The truth of the matter is that people talk to each other on a continual basis, particularly, thank you very much, to mobile telephony and technology. Mm -hmm. So they're all talking to each other, they're all trading with each other, they're all traveling across borders, and this is the reality. It's, it's not a question of whether this is going to happen. This is the world in which we live. So for me, the question is very, very simple. It's not about whether we should or whether it's working or not. It's, well, this is where we're at. How do we ensure that, as the Crown Prince indicated earlier, that we live in a society and in a community or in an environment, a country, in which people's views are respected, in which people's views are tolerated, and in which we can coexist? Nobody's saying you have to suddenly meld yourself and become one big blob and all look the same, sound the same. Certainly not. The reality is that what makes us exciting, what makes us unique, what makes us interesting is that we're different. Can you imagine if we all sat here and looked exactly the same, thought the same, sounded the same? There wouldn't be much point, would there? Anyway, I look forward to experimenting. I look forward to hearing a little bit more about this because I think it's, it's, it's a fundamental shift in the way we approach the subject that I think is, is where a lot of this comes undone, Dan. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Uh, please, then. Um, as a Turkish Muslim female, I've lived in Europe, in Asia, and the United States, and it's been a different experience in the countries that I've lived in, studied in, and worked in. And so um, what I found is that I also don't like the word multiculturalism, and I don't think it's thinking about the multicultures, but it's about everyone just understanding each other and having the open dialogue. And what I found and what the truth is, is with the technology, everyone is connected. You can connect with anyone all around the world. And, um, and this is just going to increase more and more. And so before, when we thought about technology, we thought that it would be like a sci-fi and everyone would be in their rooms alone and you would just connect with the world in your room and just like study by yourself. But it's actually been the opposite. It's been connecting people all around the world. And so with this and with the way that the world is evolving, we all have to um, to to, co to cope with this. So that everyone is the same. Ninety nine percent of ninety nine point one percent of us, as um, the prince had mentioned, we're we're just about the same people. And so the only um, the governments, societies, and companies and individuals that embrace this, those are the only ones that are going to be successful. And so even now in business, when we see the successful companies, it's successful companies that have embraced multiculturalism. Leaders in, within these firms, whether you're, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a business leader, whether you're within a corporate, it's those that are successful that have embraced this. And so with the diversity and understanding consumers in the world, the only way it is is really to embrace it. And so if you want to survive as a government, a person, a society, as a company, you really have to embrace all of this. Mm. Great, thank you. And Lucas, please. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much as well. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. I shall be speaking in German on multiculturalism, well, what I can say is that, on the one hand, it's been said it depends on the definition. Switzerland is a, a wonderful multicultural country, four different languages, four different cultures. It works, people live together. We have a very large share of foreigners, the, one of the largest in the whole world, and it works. But my criticism starts in what has happened over the past few years. There's been indifference of uh, politicians and politics vis-a-vis -vis of immigration. Politicians said, well, our doors are open, we are multicultural, we are open for each and everybody. And we are an open and uh, tolerant society, and um, there are a number of values. Our democratic society has existed for a long time, and all of a sudden we are faced with immigration 
with people coming into our um, country that uh, do not appreciate our society, do not appreciate our values, then this becomes dangerous for our liberal, democratic and open society. Having said this, I am convinced that politicians have to act against this in order to defend our multiculturalism making sure that those who want a parallel society, they should not be admitted to this country. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we will move on then. Uh, uh, and we will move on then to our final uh, panelist, Mel, please. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Dan. It's uh, nice to be here and nice to meet you. Nice to be in Switzerland. Uh, I'd just like to start my short uh, contribution by asking you a question. Anybody in the room think homelessness is a good idea? Okay, nobody. So <laughs> I've been working with uh, homeless uh, people since 1993, and I've asked this question to many audiences, rich and poor, young and old all over the world, and never once in all that time since 1993 has anybody thought it was a good idea. And yet, there are 100 million people homeless throughout the world, in every country in the world, and yet we still have it. And I will maintain you can't have a sustainable society, or a uh, multiculturalism indeed, when you've got that level of homelessness. Because what happens is these people are excluded from society. I sometimes describe and write about this as the invisible people. They become invisible. Search, uh, research has been done on this uh, in terms of people walking along the road, going to work every morning, and a month later asked what they saw in the street. And uh, around 90% of the people never saw the homeless person sitting in the street, despite walking past them all the time. And they become invisible. Um, when I was in San Francisco recently, and in the US you, you have three and a half million people on the streets, by the way, and that's the richest country in the world. Um, uh, I was amazed at the number of people who were sleeping in the streets in San Francisco. I spoke to my friends who were good, nice people, middle class. I said, it's terrible, the, the homeless people in, uh, in the center of your city. And they said, homeless people, are they there? Oh, yeah, they're kind of cool. And I went, it's not kind of cool. It's not an expression that can possibly be applied because they shouldn't be there at all. But the problem is they've been there so long, they become part of the landscape and it becomes acceptable. And to me, it's just not acceptable. And you can't ever call yourself a society that's inclusive when you have that. And it's dangerous as well because what happens inevitably with that level of exclusion uh, and people not being able to participate is you'll have explosions of, uh, of violence or people will get sick and then you will get sick. So it's in nobody's interest at all to, to, to have homelessness. And uh, maybe in the, in later in the session we'll talk about uh, how uh, we can deal with this. I mean, I run an organization called the Homeless World Cup, and what we simply do, uh, we work in 80 countries, is we make the homeless people visible. So we, we put them in football tops, they represent the country, some of you may know about it, Switzerland participates, um, and as a result, a lot of them change their lives forever. So there's lots of interventions that are really simple, that we can make if we want to create our society better. But first of all, we have to see people in the first place and then do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, and, and thank you to all of you. Uh, <clears throat> we've heard a lot so far. I, I, first of all, I, one big point I heard was multiculturalism, de facto, it is here. Yeah, so our world has changed. It's not a question of whether uh, it, we're going to be living in a multicultural world or not, it's, it's here. It's in front of us right now. Second big point I heard was maybe multiculturalism. What, what does this word actually mean? What do we want it to mean? Pragmatically, what's useful in the world right now? Uh, and, and I'd like to open it up to all of you and then ultimately to hear from uh, all of you in our audience uh, questions uh, that you might have as well. But first, what, what is your thinking? Very concretely, very practically, how might our world improve its way of dealing more effectively with differences of culture, differences of identity? What can be done? Uh, you, you've offered some examples, but what's your thinking very concretely uh, for Switzerland, for uh, really the world? Yes, please. Great, thank you. Um, 
just to get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. um, coming out of, of, of the apartheid era in South Africa, we instituted a program uh, called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm -hmm. I'm sure uh, some of you may be aware of that process. Now, there is a lot of criticism said about whether it worked or whether it didn't work or what was missing and so on. But I think the issue here is the principle of the process. Mm -hmm. In other words, you open up a dialogue mm -hmm. that doesn't point fingers and say, you were bad, naughty, you go to jail, you were nice and good, you stay at home, and you we're not sure about, so we'll keep you there for a minute. It's not that kind of conversation. What it certainly did for our country was that it forced us to have conversations. Mm -hmm. It forced the people who were the persecutors in South Africa's uh, 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 instance to actually come clean without the fear that they were going to leave the building and somebody was going to attack them for what they had done in anybody can say was a, an appalling and diabolical situation. Mm -hmm. Similarly, those who were predominantly black or freedom fighters also performed some horrendous acts uh, of murder and, and so on. And it allowed them the very same experience. What was the net result? We could recognize that, okay, these are our historical differences. We had issues about this, but now here's a point or a moment for us to move on. And I'm always curious, you know, when I see people using the fact that we're different as a negative, rather than saying, what happens if we all sit here and have dinner together or have conversations together and begin to understand what the other person's perspective is? Mm -hmm. It's not about assimilating it. It's not about agreeing with it. It's simply about saying, who are you? Where do you come from? What influences the way you view the world? What influences the decisions that you make? And in every time when I have had pre prejudices and actually sat down with people and had conversations like that with them, the net result has been exactly, again, what the Crown Prince alluded to, that we were more similar than we were different. And I think that's what I find so remarkable because we keep learning this lesson mm -hmm. and yet we don't learn the lesson. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, if I may, to, to, to my colleague on the panel here, frankly, I don't see how people stopping a person coming into a country stops them influencing you in any way whatsoever. Because technologically speaking, as an African for years, the only way we had information about the rest of the world was through television. What has been the net result? Look across the African continent. We wear Levi jeans, we wear all-star shoes, we listen to hip-hop, we love Akon, we think Norwegians are cool because they helped us during apartheid. All of this happened, not because the Norwegians came over the border and said, we're gonna hang out with you, it was because we had access to information about them. So the net result is that that's not what's going to stop people being influenced by external factors. Yes, you may physically be able to prevent them doing so, but you don't stop the influence. And the problem is if you don't have that influence happening in a context where there is somebody who can help you understand it, you cause conflict. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, good. Uh, did you understand? Yes, okay. Uh, we'll, we'll go, uh, yes, please, Lucas. Also, ich, ich bin grundsätzlich sehr einverstanden äh, well, mit der Ansicht, dass es diese Konversation braucht, dass man sich austauschen soll, aber dass diese Konversation um, überhaupt möglich ist. Und da komme ich jetzt auf ein konkretes Beispiel aus der Schweiz, uh, sage ich, wenn jemand hier eine from, uh, dauerhafte Niederlassungsbewilligung will, dann muss er mindestens eine Landessprache können here, und sonst soll er diese Niederlassungsbewilligung auch nicht bekommen, languages. dann muss er sich auch Otherwise bemühen, er will sich in diesem Land permit. niederlassen, if they want dann ist das Wichtigste für die Integration, dass er sich auch mit den Leuten hier unterhalten kann, dass er überhaupt for, uh, kommunizieren uh, kann, damit er nicht irgendwo in einer Gesellschaft uh, für sich lebt. Den ich auch sagen muss, ist, dass mit gewissen uh, Leuten, und wir haben zunehmend solche Leute in ganz Europa, die hier einwandern, da bringt eine Konversation nichts. Also hier sitze ich sehr gerne tagelang zusammen und diskutiere über die Politik und über die Welt. Ich bin vielleicht mit einem Hassprediger, der mich nur verurteilt und verachtet, sitze ich wahrscheinlich weniger gerne 
Tagelang da und führe diese I, Konversation. Also ich um, darf ihn nicht benutzen, auch einen Schnitt machen. Ich darf ihn nicht benutzen, auch einen Schnitt machen. Ich darf ihn nicht benutzen, auch einen Schnitt machen. trotzdem hier leben will. If there are individuals who the society rejects but who still want to live here, then you don't have that kind of conversation you're talking about. Yeah. No, so, um, great. And so, I mean, so in a way, what, I, what I'm hearing in, in part is how, do you, how does one preserve a certain identity, a certain culture, and yet allow for the integration of other cultures, other groups? And it seems like an essential tension uh, around this question of multiculturalism. Uh, yes, Rosie, you were, yeah. Yeah, I saw you first. I, mean, I, I wanted to engage with Lucas's um, initial points about, I feel like, you know, he describes Switzerland as having more foreigners than many other countries in the world, and I'm interested in discussing the notion of fear, the tipping point at which mm. tolerance and toleration of the other, of other cultures who bring, as my colleague <clears throat> mentioned, amazing... Um, opportunities to the country in which they take up residence, they build business, et cetera, et cetera. The point at which, and maybe Lucas can talk about that, that toleration and embracing of the other becomes too much. And I think that's the point at which, that's the, that's the sort of the critical point. And maybe, he can, maybe we can discuss that tipping point. Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, rhetoric about um, the flood of let's talk about, you know, Muslims, the, the fear of Eurabia taking over Europe. I think that's a very big and worrying um, conversation that, that spreads hatred and unfounded fear, I think. And um, I wondered if people would like to talk about that a little. The tipping point, really. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, let's get to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, you, you'd have thought as well, yes. Yeah, uh, just, uh, just a couple of things. First of all, for us, it's very important that we have... Uh, a workplace which is free of, free of discrimination. Mm -hmm. And I also think in this whole discussion, there is a danger, if you're from a political party, that you become to be seen as what it is you're trying to prevent. <laughs> so it becomes somewhat schizophrenic, that you're tolerant on one hand, but you're intolerant on another. Mm -hmm. And there's a danger of you becoming the very thing that you're trying to prevent, mm -hmm. which means you become less tolerant. Mm -hmm. My experience in Switzerland, when I arrived, I got a letter from the Sandique. He invited me and all the other people who've moved into this wonderful village called Chesere in Neon. Mm -hmm. We had dinner together. <laughs> he made a speech. We were introduced to all the societies and we were made very welcome. We are a commune. We're happy that our commune is rich in all its differences. We're delighted that you are, you are here. Mm -hmm. Join something. So I joined the football team. And then I, and because I played football, I was asked to join the fire brigade. I became a pompier. <laughs> now, Lucas, I can tell you, I was called out on action. They put this metal Swiss army helmet on my head. <coughs> I had Wellington boots, which didn't fit. <laughs> and they said, Philip, there's a fire. I had not had, I had no training. I could hardly speak French, but I tried, though. Lucas, I tried. That, that's when I realized I've got to learn French. I don't care if the political party says it. I need it to save my life. So all of a sudden, I've got the fire hose in my hand, and the advice I got was, Philip, you're too tall for this fire. Kneel down. So then I had to kneel down, and then I turned the hose onto the barn, which was on fire, and I can tell you one thing. I don't know if he was a Swiss German, a Swiss Italian, a French farmer, an Italian farmer, a Muslim farmer. I had to save his barn. And that's the message I say to you. It's a humanitarian gesture from one to another. When someone needs help, you help. When you need to put that fire out, you put that fire out. Don't fan the flames of division. We don't have enough firemen in the world. Uh, 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 let me just play devil's advocate for a minute, though, I, uh, to, to the full panel. Because, I mean, on, on, uh, to some extent, you know, I could see someone saying, but the, my values will become corroded. If, if uh, you know, to some degree, there, there will be an impurity to the tradition, to the ritual, to the values that I've been raised on, that my people around me have been raised upon over time, uh, by bringing people of a different 
uh, tradition into my culture. Yes, I might be able to have the conversation with them, but at the end of the day, I'm going to be stuck because there's going to be conflict. Uh, our values are so different that it will start to erode our own value system. Playing devil's advocate, how do you respond to that kind of, of, um, of response, uh, that, kind of, that, that kind of opinion, perspective? Well, look, I'd, I'd, get, I'd uh, give a couple, of, a couple of thoughts. One is um, I, I think the, one of the prerequisites to have um, a society that gets along with so many different cultures is a recognition that everyone has contributed to the success of that country. One interesting um, example that comes to mind for us uh, in, in, the, in the United States is in, in, in the early 60s, there was a big movement to make sure that the, uh, the books that children were learning in high schools represented the contributions of so many people in our history. And I think there was a belief that not everyone that had made positive contributions was represented there. And I think if, you know, and that always will continue to evolve, but I think if you look at um, how the history that our students learn, there is certainly a fair representation of what uh, all of the initial immigrants to the United States, the Irish, the Italians, the Germans, and the like, made. But today you're also reading about the contributions that African Americans and Hispanics and Asian Americans and Muslims and the like are making. And so I think that that, that combined recognition that everyone's making a positive um, contribution is important. You know, the second point I'd make, you know, I do think that there is, um, there has to be an open-mindedness uh, in, the, in, the, in the country, in the society, that one's own culture mm -hmm. may also blend in or be impacted by the, the one's neighbors. And I'll give you one, you know, just one simple example in the United States. Uh, it's, it's a culinary example. Um, sometimes, I don't know if people realize this, but, you know, we've had such uh, a blend of different cultures. And, and again, in this particular case, this one it comes, this influence comes from the, the Hispanic culture. Uh, today in the United States, there is more salsa than ketchup purchased in the United States. <laughs> there are more tortillas consumed every day than bagels. Hmm. And, you know, I think when you stop and think about that, you realize that that doesn't happen just because of one community. Mm -hmm. It happens because everyone is beginning to, um, to gravitate. Everyone's beginning to accept some of the other cultures, and that's permeating mainstream. Right, right. right. Yeah, and, and, and no, thank you. And, and uh, I mean, I really am hoping that we can keep digging deeper and deeper because it's one thing to say, boy, it's nice for everybody to love each other, to be nice, but we know the realities in the workplace and, and even in the family situations. How do you actually get to that place where people of different cultures can live and work and breathe effectively together? Tumi, I saw your hand, and then we'll move. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, I, I find it interesting, this notion that we're all born with culture. Mm. You know, the last time I checked, there was no baby that was born with a fur on it, a fur coat, <laughs> or loincloth, yeah. or beading in the hair. I mean, I don't know, maybe I haven't seen it, but I haven't heard of it, right? <laughs> so the way I understand culture, it is man-made. It is created by us, one. Second point, it evolves. The way, even in Switzerland, the way in which you practice what you refer to as your culture today is very different to how people would have identified culture what, 500, 600, 700 years ago? It's the same thing in Africa. It's the same thing in many, many parts of the world. So the notion that a culture is something that you bake and it stays like that is a very, again, it's a puzzling notion to me because the very nature of culture is that it evolves. That's the first point that I wanted to make. The second point, when you're asking about how, you know, how do we balance the notion of wanting to preserve your own culture, which of course people want to do. In South Africa, we have the same debate, um, where many people are complaining and saying, well, you know, our languages aren't, aren't being recognized and so on. And yet, when you ask some of these people, what is it that you're doing? in an attempt to preserve your culture in a way that is inclusive and fostering understanding rather than in, an, in, in, in a more sort of abrasive or, or, or aggressive fashion. The reality is we find that many of, of those, and I'm not saying it's the same for all, enough isn't being done in terms of helping us understand what your culture is. So prepare the food that you prepare. 
Make sure that you're singing the songs that you were raised with. Make sure that you are working to create an environment where your children can have a similar upbringing to the one that you have and longed for, that you had and longed for. And I think that's one step. It's not all. It's not the thing that's going to solve it. But I think that's one way in which we can actively promote people's cultures and similarly understanding of other people's cultures, which is equally important. Uh, Demet? As um, a person of Turkish origin, whenever I go to Europe and I say I'm Turkey, I'm from Turkey, um, the first thing that one or uh, one or the first things that I hear, especially from certain um, uh, p- certain societies, would be, "Oh, um, there's so many German, there's so many Turks living in Germany," and um, and it's it's not in a positive way, it's in a negative way, and um, the way that we that we face it. And so I I really love the example of how the U.S. has had a great melting pot, and it's fantastic in the Hispanics. But I think um, as part of this panel, we should discuss, as you mentioned. Um, Daniel, what um, the the multiculturalism or the countries where it hasn't been as successful, and who's who and what can we do in in order to make it more of a success? And so, what I find is that in um, so when I do talk to the people living in Germany, they're a Turkish origin. They feel they they don't have the equal opportunities. And so, I think it's really about. Um, ensuring that they can also get into the culture and assimilate within the culture with equal opportunities. Yeah. And that's really with the education. Mm-hmm. And that's really with le- teaching them how to fish. Mm-hmm. And so it's not placing the fish in front of them with welfare, but it's more ensuring that they have the great educational opportunities so they can develop themselves and give back to the culture. Mm-hmm. So with the immigrants, rather than just giving them the worst places to live and maybe the lowest paying jobs, it's how do we give them more of the opportunity? and more of the education in order to contribute more. And so what we see is the second generation of these immigrants with the education they're having, they're actually contributing back to society. And there's some great examples and great leaders from these immigrant families from all of these countries. And I think that's what's going to be really important. Right. So, so you're raising an issue that was raised earlier as well, but I think more explicitly now, yeah. there are multiple elements to, multi, yeah. being, to doing multiculturalism. One is the personal side of it. The other is the structural side of it. And a few others uh, talked about that on our panel so far in the organizational context, uh, in the societal context as well. Mel. Yeah, I just want to make a couple of points here. I, I, I think one of the solutions around is about economic migration. So it's, uh, the issue is uh, eliminate poverty and then people stop moving mm-hmm. um, because people are moving in, uh, in, da- in very dangerous uh, uh, circumstances and ways to uh, get to rich countries apparently to be happier, but of course they end up being homeless or, or abused or people trafficked or whatever. Um, and so the solution for that is in those countries and areas where there's poverty, um, eliminate the poverty and then you, 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 you eliminate the, the, the need for people to move in that kind of dangerous way. That's one point. Mm-hmm. A second point is about happiness. Now, I've done a number of talks to some very rich people and, and a num- it's incredible to me that how often they talk about how unhappy they are. Mm-hmm. So they have money but they're unhappy. Mm-hmm. And I kind of show them the homeless people and I say they're unhappy as well. Um, so how, how, can you, how can we try and pull these things together in a, in a society? And, you, you know, like at our uh, Homeless World Cup, we have volunteers. And, and the volunteers afterwards write to us and say, it was the most best experience of my life. I'm so happy about it. Uh, it changes the, the, the way they are. Mm-hmm. So if you're trying to create an inclusive society or a multicultural society, it's about removing these barriers of fear. People are frightened of the homeless person. I have no idea why, but they are, or they've made them invisible. But by bringing people in, you make yourself happier. You make yourself much, much better. Um, uh, And for those, I think that these type of solutions, um, if you apply them, will make for a um, a much better uh, country, a much better nation. Yes, no, and with, with time ticking, we know we have a lot of knowledge and experience in this room as well like to open it up now for questions that you might have. Uh, and, and for sake of time, what I ask is that, that the way you frame a question is in the form of a question. Uh, and, and that you limit your question to no more than one minute. Otherwise, I apologize, but I might have an undiplomatic uh, interruption. Uh, and I see your hand back there, please. And if you could introduce yourself uh, as well. Hello. Um, my name's Graham Berg, and I'm English, actually. Sorry. Um, (laughs) Welcome. Thank you. Um, My question is, you you spoke about organization, and I just had a very simple question. Is democracy 
necessary for multiculturalism. And you know, let, let's take one more. Thank you for that. And you answered it with in perfect uh, form, uh, or asked it in perfect form. Uh, maybe one more question, then we'll get two questions, and we'll throw them to the panel. Uh, yes, and I see over here in the fourth row, uh, there's a microphone coming around. And would you would you mind standing up uh, just so they can see where the microphone is? Yes, and you found yourself in the perfect spot to make it most difficult to get the microphone to you. <laughs> yes, and if you could introduce your name uh, and your question. Is it working? Hi. My name is Lillian Stadler, and I study at the University of St. Andrews. I have to apologize because my question won't be in the perfect form. It's okay. Um, this summer, I had a very tr a troubling experience when I was um, in Washington at a Oxbridge Learning Academy, and we had a major falling out, which I'm which was between my flatmate who was a Turkish Muslim and um, my co-student in St. Andrews who was um, from India initially. And she was, she was extremely upset because he turned out to be gay. And she said that that offended her, her religious beliefs and that offended her as a person. And we had no idea how to confront that situation, how to talk about it, how we felt about it. So I was wondering how your thoughts we're on that situation. Great. No, thank you. So uh, two questions, and I, I see these really hitting one at the personal level, one at the structural level. Let's start with the structural level, and then we'll move to the more personal piece. Uh, democracy. Is it a necessary prerequisite for a multicultural society? Yes, no, maybe. What are your thoughts? Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes? I think, I think, of, the four, think, of, the, think of the Eastern Bloc pre-1989. Um, those non-democratic societies were also very homogenous. There was a lot of racism, a lot of anti-Semitism in many Eastern European countries. Since they've opened up, since they've become democratic, I think that has changed a little bit. I gather that there's a, a rising amount of anti-Semitism in Hungary, but um, I think that's a sort of an example, a, a recent example from history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, yes? Um, I, I have to say that I don't know not because I'm, I'm a, a non-supporter of democracy, if anything, I'm, I'm very, very <laughs> supportive of democracy, but I look across the African continent and I look at uh, examples of countries where there is democracy. They have elections, people go to the ballots, they get the blue ink on the thumb, you know, everybody's voting, they elect. However, they're incredibly intolerant. So I'm not sure that automatically, by default, the fact that you have a so-called democratic dispensation will foster tolerance. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I don't know that it's as easy as, as, as saying yes or saying no. I, I, in my view, I, I think the jury in many ways is still out, um, which, which then, I suppose, begs the question whether the assumption that a, a cultural environment or, or a culturally healthy environment <laughs> can only function in the context of a political system. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, for me, you, democracy for, for, for multiculturalism is, a, is, is an absolute. And I think it's, it's about what are the constituents of it? Freedom of, freedom of expression, mm -hmm. freedom of association, the freedom to express oneself, the freedom to organize, and the freedom to enjoy the democratic freedoms that you have. And I'm pleased to say that in the course of the last three decades, this world has become a more democratic place. And in, you know, when I started this job, uh, Latin America with military dictatorships. I used to go into those places, South Africa. We used to go into South Africa. And I think as a white face, I used to get through immigration without any difficulties. If they'd known that I was talking to the trade union movement and others, then the door would have been shut. Democracy is, is necessary in all its diversity. I would just have this hope, maybe I'm naive, that the principal political actors would do more to bring their societies together as opposed to scoring political points by driving them apart. I'd much prefer a political party to be straight on its economic plans and say, this is my plan for the country, as opposed to try to find those populist divisions which so divide us. So I would call for responsibility and restraint. And democracy is about openness. I don't know it hasn't been mentioned here. We, we live in this globalized age. There are nearly 265 million migrant workers, and this is going to double in the course of the next, in the next uh, two decades. 
more than we can have 5% of the world's workforce who are migrant workers. There's constant traffic. And at the same time in Europe, we have a demographic challenge where the level of prosperity that we have grown used to and developed and the welfare that we have, which is currently questioned, we will not maintain this as our population actually does begin to shrink. So we, from the economics of the situation, we need, we need to have this fluidity in our labour markets, but we also need fair play at the same time. And, and there's one thing that bothers me, of that 260 million or so, we have 27 million people humanly trafficked. This is the new slave labour. And I think there, political parties of all complexions, civil society and others, really have to s stamp out the, this underside of the globalised economy of 27 million human being humanly trafficked, and a third of those are under the age of 12. Yes. So, uh, and, and back to the, ba the, the, the basic question, democracy a prerequisite? Yes, maybe, Mel, what? Uh, my answer is yes, but. Um, uh, and the but being I'm really concerned about democracy in this modern age. I think it's, it's, it's out of, got out of touch. It's, it's more relevant, I believe, for the 1950s. It's got stuck there. Um, and with the, with the speed of things like the internet and technology advance, um, the, the, the politicians, I believe, aren't becoming fit in terms of their representation. Talent isn't going towards the political. We've got a crisis of leadership, I believe. Um, I, you know, I don't think you can say you're a proper democracy when you've got the level of homelessness I will go on about that issue, or when you have poverty, I don't think you can call yourself a, 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 a democracy. And um, so there's a, a number of challenges. So I think the, the, uh, and the other thing that's happening is that the, the political parties, for them, homelessness doesn't become a, a mainstream issue because it's just the middle that's, that they're interested in getting into power. So it's just they're, 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 they're focusing on a particular group of people in the middle, and their interests are, 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 are at the top of the agenda at the exclusion of all else. So I, I, I believe we've got a problem with democracy, and it, and it really has to be modernized, and we have to look at it uh, urgently. I'm convinced that it can only work with democracy. There's no other way. There has to be democracy. Also, a multicultural society can only work with democracy. Well, what alternative uh, would there be? How could democracy be modernized? The nice thing about democracy is that every minority, every small group can have a say, and we've uh, solved that well in uh, Switzerland. There's there's um, protection for minorities. The cantons also have a say. We have a majority of uh, the cantons that has a impact uh, in referenda. Everyone can collect signatures uh, to have a referendum. That plays a very important role for everybody. For a minority group that wants to achieve something, for example, more rights, but also for the Swiss uh, who said, well, uh, we have to change something now, the politicians have neglected us. Democracy makes for a balance, and um, if uh, the population feels uh, this has gone too far, something has to happen, the population can react with those democratic tools, and then there will be a better solution rather than just um, deciding in an undemocratic way. I think democracy is an important element, definitely. And, and, and then you, you uh, assuming democracy, democracy is perhaps, uh, perhaps necessary, there still is the challenge that was raised uh, by, by the, the student in the fourth row here. How do you actually deal with these differences? You know, very practically speaking, what happens when you have a, a student who's struggling with a fellow student who has a different value system, and those value systems come into conflict? You know, to me, this is really the, a, a huge part of the essence of the challenge. As much as South Africa has had this major transformation, there's still struggle there. There's still struggle in Northern Ireland. There's still struggle in the United States, you know, really around the world. How do we grapple with and really deal with these value-based differences, whatever the – and to some degree, I think, even if it's um, uh, a, a place that moves somewhat away from, a, from an explicit democracy, uh, some of the, the um, more traditional cultures in the Middle East, uh, the governments there, there's some common problems I think we all face around dealing with these value-based differences. What's your advice? What would be your thinking if that student approached you privately and said, look, I need some help? 
I need some advice here. You know, my, my, my two, I, I forget the exact details, but something like my two roommates are in the midst of a conflict right now. Uh, there's a value-based difference. Uh, one has strong religious values uh, that say uh, that, that sexual uh, activity should only be in one direction, uh, and, and, and someone says, no, it should be in another direction. What do you do? How do you respond to that kind of uh, situation? Well, I think she, um, the student was in a, living in a country where homosexuality is legal and tolerated, and I would say, I'm afraid you're, in this, you're, you're within a, a community in which it's, it's, it isn't acceptable and it is not illegal, and you have to find a way of giving each other space, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's an, that's an easy answer. And it goes back to the question of fear that we were talking about earlier. And the signs and symbols of otherness, the minarets, um, the banning of more minarets being built in Switzerland. And recently in New York, we've spoken a lot about multiculturalism in America. And I'd like to, um, I'd like to mention... Um, a recent example, which is the building of an Islamic cultural center in New York City. It has created enormous divisions, and there have been huge protests against it. And we talk, we're talking about America as the, you know, the poster child for multiculturalism. Even in a place like America, even in a place like New York, uh, a country like America, which constitutionally recognizes, um, you know, religious, re any, you know, any person's right to practice their religion in freedom. Um, even there, you have huge problems. It's about fear. It's about ignorance. And, um, I, you know. And um, what I think it's really important is to have exposure at a very young age. And so with the differences, with the different cultures. And that's why I'm really hopeful for the future. Because now, as young people, we do have that exposure. And I think the ignorance and the fear actually goes away when you realize that these people are just like us. And so uh, we're very similar. So I think that what's going to be really important is exposure, having more um, contact points, touch points. And that's why I think the future will be better in that way. And that's, I think technology is going to be a major force behind that. Yeah. Now, and, and one other thought, if, if I may move away from my role for a moment as the moderator, uh, there's a simple little exercise that we sometimes do in negotiation trainings, and we call it the role reversal exercise. Uh, and it's simply having each person in the conflict for a minute move chairs and imagine they are that other person. And someone just starts asking them questions. What do things look like from your perspective? And people are often very resistant to talking in that other perspective. I, well, yeah. But, but to really have them talk in that first person from that other perspective, they start to at least see that different world as, as um, uncomfortable as that world might be or different as that, that world might be. I know we have hand, a, a number of hands up. I want to make sure we have time to hear some voices. Uh, and you know what? Is there anybody in the way back whose hand I can't see? Uh, yes, uh, sir over there, uh, please. So where's the microphone? Yes, the hands seem to be always completely opposite the microphones. <laughs> ah, yeah, and you're... Ah. So... Um, and again, if you could state your name and... Uh, my name is, is Hans-Peter Meyer. I went to see school, and now I'm a European uh, businessman in several countries and several, speaking several languages. Uh, don't you think uh, that uh, interface is one of the big issues, cultural interfaces? I think one interface was mentioned, it was football. So if you can create, like with computers, interfaces between human beings, and if you have a set of communication, this really facilitates... Uh, uh, work, uh, working together and living together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, thank you. And maybe we could even take that one step further. What have you found works in, in terms of interfacing, bringing people together to help promote that sense of deeper understanding? And I, you know, we have a lot of experience with that on our panel. Yes. I, I, I would just throw out, I think, you know, media and, and, and certainly social media and the new technology we're talking about, but the ability to recognize that there are other people in your same situation and be able to find some camaraderie in that I think is a, is a big contributor. And, and I think media in that sense is, uh, it plays a vital, vital role. Yeah. And, and so for, be specific, what would that look like? Well, you know, in, in, in our particular case, um, you know, I know that one of the challenges that we face in the United States um, right now is because of the ma macroeconomic situation and, and, and job, lack of jobs and the like in, in certain parts of the country. Um, you know, we have a, a debate going on in the United States about undocumented immigrants. Uh, and there are approximately 12 million undocumented Im immigrants. And I think that conversation has become much more heated over the last few years um, because there is a lack of, of, of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so having um, 
individuals who are caught in the middle of that discussion be able to have a platform to be able to talk to people mm -hmm. in their similar situations, um, I think creates an outlet uh, to begin the communication. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I, I obviously would think a, a big yes to your, uh, your point. I mean, what we do at the Homeless World Cup is we bring uh, homeless people from this year, was uh, last year rather, 64 countries, and put them together, and they can't necessarily speak the same language. They've come from the same place in the world being, being homeless. But the, the energy and, 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 and the, the, the collective uh, spirit between them all is just fantastic. It's something to behold, and it's a, that's about the whole spirit of humanity played out in front of your eyes, and, and there you can build on something. But let me just tell you a little story connected with that for, for 30 seconds, just to illustrate how you can create real change in people's thinking by putting people together. So a few years ago, our event was held in Cape Town in uh, South Africa, and the, the team that was coming from Denmark told their manager that they were the poorest people in the world. There was nobody poorer than them living in Denmark. And the manager said, I don't know if that's true, you know, I think there might be people poorer than you, and they said, no, 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 we are the poorest, and they, they felt really bad about it. So they went down to South Africa, to Cape Town, and they went to um, some of the shanty towns, uh, and uh, uh, within about five minutes, they said, okay, we're, we're, not, we're not the poorest uh, people, uh, actually, and there's people much worse than us, we've decided. And it changed them in terms of their attitude about themselves and to other people, and they started giving things that they had to the other South Africans. Mm -hmm. And the South African uh, homeless people um, said, uh, wow, we never knew white people could be homeless. So their whole attitude changed. <laughs> so they, they, and then they became great friends together uh, and, and were able to build on that experience of, 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 of change. And so if you can create a way in which you uh, move people away from being invisible and you create a, a, a all, all we're doing is just creating a, a different infrastructure, if you like, mm -hmm. and put people in, in it together, you can create massive change. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, yes, questions, and let me ask, where's the microphone? <laughs> uh, and uh, there's uh, been someone eagerly uh, with their hand raised, R right over there, please, yes. Uh, Philipp Langer-Heinecke from Germany, living in Switzerland. Uh, you mentioned before internet, you're understanding a lot more about people in the other countries. Is that the solution? My question is, how much is done to understand the otherness in your own country? How much is done in the education, in training, uh, in school, etc., to learn about, let's say I'm German, about the Turks in, 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 in that there's nothing, uh, there's no training, no, no role plays, nothing to, to make this, this community and uh, understand them at home. And because it's nice to see them all put, oh, well, I'm Turkey, then you adjust to the values, but that's far away. It's something different if you have to share something in your own vicinity. And I feel that uh, education has lost a little bit with the challenges. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, thinking on the, yes, please. Yeah, and that's what I was saying about the exposure at a young age. So whether it's in school. So I went to school in New York City. And in New York City, in one of our schools, what we would have is we'd have our cultural days. So everyone would come from a different culture and they would bring things about their food, about their country, and just talk about it. And I think it was really fortunate. At, uh, at four or five years old, I had this exposure. And I think this has to happen in schools around the world. And we need to expose children at a very young age what other cultures are about and what other people are about. So whether it's study exchange programs, whether it's talking about these cultures, whether it's videos, whether it's media, like everyone mentioned. I think these are it's really, really important. And I just don't think that... Um, um, the education systems are paying enough attention to this. You know, I, I find it interesting because in South Africa we have significant challenges in terms of education. And, and, and the question that everybody's asking at the moment is whether or not um, our education system prepares people for living in the future. Now, what I find intriguing about this notion is that it's always done in an economic business context. In other words, we need more engineers because we're going to need more roads, so maths and science. But what we forget is that we're also going to be living next to Turks and Germans and Swiss and Norwegians and Swedes and all of this kind of thing. And in fact, there are many, many South Africans who are getting the skills, and what's happening? They're getting poached. So they live in London. There's a huge community of South Africans in London, in New York, in Atlanta, in you know, there's a, a, a black African guy who's a mayor of a city in Russia. 
So, so it's happening right now. And I, I think that the, the point about education is so, so, so important. Mm -hmm that it's not just about whether you can read and write and do mathematics. It's also about the environment in which you're going to live, not just the environment in which you are expected to produce an end product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, your comments remind me of a conversation I had last year with uh, a top-level negotiator in, from China, and, and I was very excited to meet this person to learn, what's your, what's your techniques? How are you so good at negotiating? And he said, oh, well, you know, and he gave me the example of a recent negotiation he had with the, with, the, um, with the United States representatives. He said, we spent about a week, our negotiating team, thinking about culture before we went to negotiate with the Americans. I said, wow, you spent a whole week thinking about American culture. And he said, oh, no, no, no. We spent a week thinking about our own culture. <laughs> and, and, and I think he was dead right. You know, dead right. That's the power of education. Uh, Lucas. Also ich bin absolut einverstanden, dass Bildung ein ganz, ganz wichtiges Thema ist. I couldn't agree more. Education is an important topic. And you can reach a great deal of progress through education. But if you look at the Swiss educational system, then we do too much in this direction. And we tend to forget our own identity and our own culture. Well, let me give you a few examples, and uh, please let me speak. There are a number of schools that uh, do not have any Christmas celebrations anymore. There are schools that teach children um, Serbian or Croat language first before they learn German. And in St. Gaul there was a inquiry and in other cities. What is the most frequent reason why young families move away from cities? And about 39% of those families said we move away because there are too many foreign uh, kids at school, we don't want to send our kids to those schools in a class with five foreigners, it's okay, there will be integration, but if you have 17 to 20 or 18 foreigners out of 23 kids, there's no way you can integrate anymore. And, and, uh, and, and comments to, to that, and, and I want to note uh, the important, uh, we're talking about multiculturalism, we're speaking within the framing that, that, that uh, the Crown Prince had said of really trying to come from a place of understanding and listening, and I, really, and I encourage that for today as well. Could the microphone come toward the front, uh, and yes, uh, to, to the uh, woman with the, the cap on, please. Hi, my name is Maria Nunes Graber. I came here to Switzerland with 11 years old, and I was born in Brazil, but my father is Swiss. So you say, Mr. Reinmann, that people are going away and saying, oh, we don't, have, don't want to have anything to do with people that come from other cultures. And I'm coming from uh, integration class. I learned five languages. I did everything I could to be the best, to have half mm, as much chances as other people had because they were born in Switzerland, they were full blood. How, how does I even heard this kind of things? How can somebody from a government, from a party say, that's something we want to support? Well, that was not a value judgment, what I said. And uh, the parents aren't saying, we don't want our kids to mingle with uh, foreign kids. That's not the way it is. I think the parents see it as enrichment uh, to have foreign uh, children around. But there are studies, there are also studies by the OECD that state clearly that if you have a certain number of foreign children at school and um, those children may have difficulties uh, with the language, um, children that came later uh, followed their fathers uh, and mothers, and they are having difficulties. In the city where I live, 
the three schools and the school with the largest number of foreign children, it's 80%. Uh, those children leaving that school will not have um, success in the future. They can't go to high school. And my proposal as a politician is that we will create what we call integration classes so that, first of all, they go through this integration class, they learn a language, they are brought to the same level as the Swiss kids, and then they will be integrated into to the ordinary school. This will be good for the foreign school, foreign kids, they will be promoted, and it will also be good for the Swiss kids because they won't be leveled down. And the problem is when parents move away, then you will have neighborhoods in cities with 90% um, share of foreigners, and in other neighborhoods it will be just 5%. And that could be avoided with my initiative. Uh, to me, yeah, I, I, it's, it's not really a response. I, I'm, I just have a question because I'm, I'm trying to understand. Uh, you say that in, in this study um, they showed that when there is a high percentage of, of foreign children in the school, um, that things sort of levels are dropping and standards are dropping. Um, and therefore, the argument is made that these children should be put in a pen somewhere else until they come right and then bring them back. So my, my question, and I'm trying to understand, is in the context of the environment in which they're already in, does this study say anything about the difference if these children are given additional tutoring in the environment that they're already living, without taking them away and putting them in a box, but perhaps giving them an additional few hours in the afternoon? Does that make any difference at all? Also, also die, die OECD Studie, die well, I'm not really familiar with the details of the OECD study. Could, could you please be objective in, in, in the audience? But it's okay to have um, uh, tutorial lessons in the afternoon. I have nothing against that. But the, the, it's a fact, and it's been proven. And um, teachers can uh, confirm this, then if you have a large share of foreigners with poorly integrated uh, children, the level will come down. Uh, there will be a lot of time spent on language, on integration, on uh, getting them used to the climate and so on. And that is not necessary, is it? The question is how to, how, how to deal with a variety of different students within the classroom context, what makes the most sense, and, how, and what's the research that helps to support yeah. things one way or another? Yes? Could we unpack a little bit about, I mean, being a foreigner in Switzerland versus being a foreigner in Britain? versus the United States versus Germany or somewhere like that. I mean, how are, are foreigners in Switzerland, do they feel stakeholders in Swiss society? I, I understand it. I, I, I'm not sure if this is correct, and I hope someone will um, correct me, but foreigners aren't allowed to buy property in this country. Is that correct? No, no, no. No, I don't that's not true anymore. No, I think the well, look, I am Swiss, by the way. <laughs> I am Swiss. I made the promise. I am Swiss, and um, I, I look at it from the labor market perspective. We are entering a future where we're going to require more people from other countries to come to Europe to do work. And, and there's, I, was, I just asked someone whilst I was coming here, what, what's the situation in construction? You talked about whether you can buy a home. I can tell you who builds the homes. 85% of the people in the construction industry in this country are here on work permits. Right. And then, then I asked, well, what about Swiss chocolate? 65% of the workforce in chocolate factories are migrant workers. And, and therefore... Which means this, they're, not, they're which, not permanent members which means of the society. That there are, there, they are, no, no, there's intergenerational change. This country, this country works with migrant workers. And I just wish this was, and the migrant worker has made a brilliant contribution to the economic success of this country. This should be seen as a good news story, above and beyond the fact that we have the different cantons, the different language groupings. Why can't you, I would, if I was presenting the Swiss brand to the world, I would say this is a good place to do business. We are harmonious. 
We can integrate workers in the modern context. This country will not work without migrant workers. And I know from my wife's a teacher, I can tell you, she's had 30 nationalities in her class. And you would be amazed at the wonderful and brilliant things they do. They learn more together. They have a good conversation together, Lucas. They actually begin to enjoy each other's company. And, and I, therefore, I, and I realize that inner city ghettos have a, have a, have a, pr a problem in, in, uh, in this uh, regard. They do. It, Brit Switzerland is a small, extremely wealthy country. Britain is a very different kettle of fish. We can't kind of lump all these countries together. It's just True. silly. Mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and I'm sure your wife has had a wonderful experience teaching in Switzerland. But Leeds is different, and Bradford's different, and Brooklyn's different. Yeah, she also so, taught in, in East London. Right, and I've lived in East London myself. Yeah. I, know, yeah. I know the story. So, so, I mean, so the big questions we're grappling with, one of them is, is really the question of who is the we? <laughs> and, and, and secondly, how do you define the, who the we is and, who, and, and how you're supposed to treat the not we, the other? And, and it seems like, at an essence, this is the debate and tension that I, you know, I think is, is emerging here. Uh, time for another question. Yes, and if we could have the microphone toward the front, please. And if you could introduce yourself uh, and the question. I'm Christoph de Haan. I'm a supporter and beneficent of uh, multiculturalism. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel for advice about the borderline. It's a touchy issue of where tolerance ends. And I'm citing such issues like forced marriage, female circumcision, mm -hmm. um, anti-democratic opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, where do we draw the line legitimately? Yes. So, no, it's, it's a wonderful question. So, a, a key theme that's come up so far has been the importance of, and I think everybody on the panel agrees with this, and the questions from the audience as well, the importance of understanding. And you're pushing this one step further, and you're saying, yes, there's understanding, but that understanding at some point is going to have to move toward decision-making uh, within the governmental and informal uh, realms as well. Where is the line? Where is the line? And, and, and to, to be specific, I, I like your notion of being specific around some of these issues, such as forced marriage, etc. Where's the line? What's your thinking? Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really straightforward. It's the, it's the laws of the land. And in a democracy, you vote for the, 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 the politicians that make the laws of the land. And I think there's, the, there's issues like, take for, forced marriage, for an example. If, if it's against the law of the land, because, because that's the way the people, then it's against the law of the land, that's it, it shouldn't be allowed. The challenge with forced marriages, though, is that people will take the, 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 the people out of the country and then come back into the country. Mm. Um, and so we, internationally, and, and Phil talked about this issue earlier, about human trafficking and these issues, we have to be collaborating together uh, um, uh, as governments um, and as police forces um, to stop this type of uh, trafficking and sort of thing occurring. But at the end of the day, um, you have to have democratic uh, systems and laws that, 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 that uh, we all abide by. And, and, and there's some things which we find uh, in these laws which are just completely unacceptable. And that should be the way the line is. And just quick snapshots, Rosie. Well, well, forced marriage, female circumcision, those are almost easier examples. What about Sarkozy banning the, the burqa, the veil? Where's the harm in wearing a veil? There's harm in forced marriage. That's well documented. There's medical harm in female circumcision. What's the harm with the veil? But it pushes people's buttons. It presses the limits of toleration. I'm sorry. There is, there is, as far as I'm concerned, there is never a day that I'm ever going to agree that the law of the land makes doing something right. I'm sorry. That's just not on. Hmm. We had the law in the land. The law of the land in my country said that I couldn't go where I want. I couldn't marry who I want. I couldn't have children with whom I want. I couldn't buy property in my own country. In, I mean, law of the land? Sorry. Okay. You know, I, I, just, I, I, I said, uh, to be quite clear. Well, if I can just finish said, my point and you'll be able to, to, okay. to respond. Okay. So in, as far as I'm concerned, there is no <laughs> environment that by simply saying law of the land, it makes it okay. What I think society needs to do, and this is where we need to just take the blinkers off and have a reality check, okay? 
We live in a society where effectively there are no borders. Yes, there are borders, of course, but we, 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 we talk languages and we, we, we travel and we do all sorts of things. The reality is that there is a recognition and there has to be a recognition about what is harmful to individuals. We have such things as human rights charters. Why do we speak as if these things don't exist? They exist. Got it. No. Can I just <laughs> come back to what I said? Uh, I said law of the land in a democracy. And the, the, the point I made earlier South about... South Africa about, was a democracy. About, so about, about, wait a minute. It was wait, a democracy. Let, let me just finish my point. So yeah, I'll let you finish your point. <laughs> I'm sorry, you, I'm sorry. Finish mine. I um, my point was that uh, I made earlier was that uh, democracy currently had real problems because it wasn't actually representing what the people say. So to take your Sarkozy point, that was never a, 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 a decision that was made by the people. There wasn't a, a, a democratic discussion. He made that decision, and his political party made that decision. That's the problem with democracy at the moment. It's, you're not getting into the proper debates so that people can, uh, like Phil in Switzerland, put his point of view and win the debate and the argument, and then, and then laws uh, of the land uh, are, are, are formed around that. And if, if, you, if you have a situation where you're going to say we're, go we're not going to ignore, ignore the laws of the land or not have laws of the land, you don't have a democracy. So democracy's got a real trouble at the moment, I believe, because you're ending up with being non-democratic. So take homeless people again. In this country and other countries, they can't vote. They're not allowed to vote. That's not a democracy as far as I'm concerned. We need to create a way in which people can be included in a, in a process quickly that allows proper laws, fair and just laws, uh, to, 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 to run the country. And I recognize there's a lot more conversation that could happen here. Uh, <laughs> and, and on multiple levels. But, and, and I apologize, we don't have more time for questions at this point. Uh, but but I, we started off with the basic notion of multiculturalism. What does this actually mean? Maybe this isn't the right word. It seems like a fluffy word. What's really behind it? And I feel like I have a feeling if we had another 15 hours today, we really would get somewhere. <laughs> Um, but I, I want to close with just one final little anecdote that I'm reminded of from the, our conversation. One of my mentors, he's now, I, I believe, right around 90 years old, Roger Fisher, many years back was in the U.S. Army Air Corps. for one of those big B-17 bombers. And the pilot of the plane, uh, they were breaking in a new engine on one of these planes. And the pilot of the plane was known to be this extremely adventurous, if not crazy, individual. And he decided, it was a beautiful sunny day, he decided just for a little fun, he was going to turn off one of the engines on this big B-17 bomber flying over the cold North Atlantic waters. <laughs> Nobody cared anything about this uh, until he decided to turn off another engine and another and another. True story. Until all four engines were off on this B-17 bomber. Everybody in the back of the plane was going, Great, what's going on? What's going on? They're thinking, shall we jump out of this plane with our parachutes? Even if we jump out, we're going to die in these cold Atlantic waters. The co-pilot had seen everything that was going on, and he had been as angry as can be at this whole situation. The pilot decided, I've had enough fun, and he goes to turn back on the engines. But for those of you who have ever seen a B-17 bomber and tried to operate it, you cannot turn on any of the engines unless it's parked, unless you get the electricity. <laughs> Suddenly, the pilot realizes this fact, the co-pilot realizes this fact, and the co-pilot all of a sudden just bursts out laughing, saying, boy, oh boy, have you got a problem, you know? <laughs> and the reality is that plane was going down. They all had a problem. And I think that's the situation with multiculturalism. It's not just a problem. It is the answer as well. How do we you know, build upon the opportunity of people's uh, different cultural backgrounds? And just to end that story, uh, how did Roger live? It so turns out that there was a young officer on board. It was not his duty to do so, but he recalled there was a little generator, putt-putt generator in the back. They were able to start one engine, and from there they were able to start all of the engines. So on that note, <laughs> um, no, just with the note ultimately of thinking through how do we work effectively together with a shared problem, a shared opportunity in front of us, Please join me in a big thank you to all of our panelists, including uh, his, 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 Hawking as well. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. That bridge. Ladies and gentlemen, um, three days ago, I had the privilege to open the 
Open Forum Davos 2012 in German. Let me close in English as we, are, we went through the English discussions here. You remember three points that I mentioned that are important for us at the World Economic Forum. The one is integrating all the groups of interest, the stakeholders, and really to engage people of the government, business people, NGOs, social entrepreneurs, and I think, right out of the way, the, all the panels, including this one, were good examples for this. My second point was, let us have, op that we are all open for engaged, honest, fundamental discussions, and have dialogue with the Davos people, that I'm happy to see so many in here, to have the dialogue with the students that came here, not only from Davos, but from all over Switzerland, Germany, uh, that join often every year. Um, expert and leaders that are at the annual meeting and join here, and I see a lot of these batches, you immediately know who is at the annual meeting. Um, but also whole groups like the, like the Adenauer Foundation who come every year to the Open Forum. A third point that we, I made was that I said we strive for respect and solution-oriented dialogue. That does not mean we go, that we guarantee harmony. That does not mean that we have a one and only solution. It does not mean even that we accept or buy into the opinion of another one. What it means is that we try to find a common ground for change, for development, for learning, for improvement. And I left the student yesterday in the evening that in a very challenging and uh, great dialogue stood up and said the following to the public and to Occupy. And she said, a very young girl, I think 17, 18, coming from the Swiss German part, said, I love to see that Occupy is here on stage. I love to see that a young woman came up to say what Occupy wants, thinks, and where they see solution. And I'm disappointed because you didn't show respect, you didn't go for the dialogue, you didn't strive for solutions, and that is what I think is the, the point. Here we go for solutions. We may not find the solution. Maybe we find the little generator. But at least this is the soul of this, to be open, strive for a clear dialogue, and let us at least get some more understanding. Let us get the common ground. Let me thank you, the school, because we are every year here in this room. Let me thank the team that organizes all these sessions. Let me thank the advisor board that helps us, of course, to, to define with all of you the topics. Thanks to the speakers and moderators who do a wonderful job. And uh, let me thank you, the audience, because you really helped us to have a great dialogue and I guarantee you, we continue with this next year. Uh, we all look forward next year to the Open Davos. Thank you all.